Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, this book, The Anarchist Roots of Geography. And I gave the same talk two nights ago in Ljubljana, and one of the questions afterwards, well, some, one of the comments, really, which was shared by a lot of people, uh, was, oh, that's not the talk I th was expecting at all. I thought it was going to be about maps and cartography and, and various sorts of... Uh, like concrete geographies of anarchism and really what I'm talking about here is uh, exactly as Marco said like some of the theories and some of the ideas that we can work with in thinking of the connections between space or geography and anarchism um, and so I've been inspired in my own work uh, particularly by Elise Reclus, who some of you are most likely familiar with, um, an anarchist and a geographer. Um, and he, a long time ago, he was writing uh, over a century ago um, on anarchism. He was also a, a vegetarian, and uh, this particular piece was inspiring for some of the ways that I'm um, thinking about now geography and the, the potential beauty of that uh, of anarchism and how geography and anarchism come together when we start to think about the beautiful possibilities. And so Recluse said, let us become beautiful ourselves and let our life be beautiful. So again, talking about vegetarianism here, but I think there's a wider kind of message that can be applied to a lot of Recluse thought, that he was very much um, a poetic kind of thinker and writer and wanted to explore the you know the beautiful possibilities that anarchism entailed. So I'll start there uh, with the beautiful geographies of anarchism. A few years ago Jerry Kearns wrote, it must be admitted that anarchist studies in geography remain a hope rather than a reality. In plain and simple, my current intellectual project aims to change that. For far too long, geographers and scholars more generally have ignored anarchism and the beautiful praxis that it implies. My intention, or at least my hope, is to return anarchist studies to the center of geography's disciplinary map and to bring it into wider academic currency. Long before the Marxist turn in geography was uh, initiated by David Harvey in the late 1960s and early 1970s, anarchist geographies were the primary form of radical geography. While Marxists were a century away from making their mark on geography, Peter Kropotkin and Elise Reclus were well-respected members of the academic community. Each played a pivotal role in the development of geographical thought. Uh, both men were brilliant and celebrated thinkers known for their scholarly achievements and scientific discoveries. Reclus was awarded the prestigious gold medal of the Paris Geographical Society in 1892 and was appointed Chair of Comparative Geography at the University of Brussels two years later. Kropotkin, for his part, was invited to join the Imperial Russian Geographical Society, the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and was even offered an, end an endowed chair at the University of Cambridge in 1896. He ultimately declined Cambridge's offer as it was contingent upon him setting aside his politics. Uh, Reclus, on the other hand, was permanently banned from France in 1871, owing to his involvement in the Paris Commune, but his sentence was commuted to 10 years and he returned to France in 1879, and he benefited in that way from the general amnesty. Meanwhile, in 1874, Peter Kropotkin was arrested and imprisoned in St. Petersburg for subversive political activity, uh, but he escaped in 1876 and fled his home country. French authorities arrested him again in 1882, this time for his involvement in the International Workers' Association, but he was released four years later and continued to be politically active. And so, um, I hope you've all been taking notes along the way about the dates in particular, because there's going to be a quiz after the talk. So, uh, no, the point is not to memorize the date. The point of all this is to uh, basically shed some light on the fact that neither men, neither of these two individuals shied away from their political commitments. Both Kropotkin and Reclus refused to allow their appeals for anarchism to be silenced and they equally resisted the disparagement of anarchism at every possible turn. 
The convictions of these two intrepid political thinkers left an indelible mark on the discipline of geography, and while they are arguably known, uh, better known today for their anarchism than they are for their contributions to geographical thought, the two are actually inseparable. Neither Kropotkin nor Reclus treated their politics as distinct from their other work. And indeed, it's fair to say that it was their commitment to anarchist ideals that invigorated their approaches to geography by infusing a unique and beautiful sense of creativity into their scientific insights. My own approach then should not be read as an opening salvo for anarchist geographies, but rather an attempt uh, to return to the radical roots of the discipline. While there are all sorts of unsavory ideas in geography's disciplinary past, from the colonial impulses of Halford Mackinder's geopolitics, to the social Darwinism of Frederick Ratzel's Lebensraum, to the implicit racism of Ellen Churchill Semple's environmental determinism, this is not the broken foundation that I want to build upon. Instead, I want to appeal to the promise of spatial emancipation and the idea that hope can be realized through a reinvigoration of an anarchist geography. So this talk accordingly sets the stage for a radical, rhizomatic politics of possibility and freedom through a discussion of the insurrectionary geographies that suffuse our daily experiences. By embracing anarchist geographies as kaleidoscopic spatialities that allow for non-hierarchical connections between autonomous entities, wherein solidarities are voluntarily assembled in opposition to sovereign violence, premeditated norms, and assigned categories of belonging, we configure a political imagination that is capable of demanding the impossible. Experimentation in and through space is a story of humanity's place on the planet. And the stasis and control that now supersedes ongoing organizing experiments is an affront to our very survival. Singular ontological modes that favor one particular way of doing things disavow geography by failing to understand the spatial as an ongoing mutable assemblage that is intimately bound to temporality. Even worse, such stagnant ideas often align to the parochial interests of an elite minority and thereby threaten to be our collective undoing. What is needed is the development of new relationships with our world and crucially with each other. By infusing our geographies with anarchism, we unleash a spirit of rebellion that foregoes a politics of waiting for change to come at the behest of elected leaders and instead engages new possibilities of mutual aid through direct action in the here and now. Anarchism is accordingly framed as a perpetually evolving process of geographical prefiguration that seeks to refashion entrenched modes of understanding and being in the world vis-a-vis -vis the authoritarian institutions, proprietary relations, and pugnacious geopolitics that dominate contemporary politics and their associated configurations of space. We can no longer accept the decaying, hideous, and archaic geographies of hierarchy that chain us to statism, capitalism, gender domination, heteronormativity, racial oppression, speciesism, and imperialism. Instead, and in following Kropotkin and Reclus, I want to argue that geography must become beautiful wherein the entirety of its embrace is aligned to emancipation. Uh-oh, it's not gonna work on me. Yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, um, so I wanna talk about um, Reclus' idea of a universal geography and move this towards the idea of relational space, which is the way that uh, in the contemporary moment, many geographers are starting to think about connectivity. Um, and I've got a quote here from Kropotkin, The Spirit of Revolt. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can skim through it as I'm speaking, I suppose. Uh, but the final part here, um, he talks about it, this idea that uh, as soon as it became apparent that the established order has not the force one had supposed, right? So he's thinking that there are possibilities to change things, to change the system that we uh, currently have. He says, one courageous act has sufficed to upset in a few days the entire gov governmental machinery to make the Colossus tremble. Okay, so from universal geography to relational space. 
and setting out to argue that we must reorient geographical thinking towards the anarchist horizons of possibility, I draw heavily on both Kropotkin and Reclus within my own work. Uh, in particular, I've been inspired by Reclus' notion of a universal geography, which has significant resonance with the contemporary relational turn that we are witnessing in the discipline of geography today. Similarly, Kropotkin's theory of mutual aid is a primary source of inspiration, which is an idea rooted in cooperation and reciprocity, and thus corresponds very closely with the current interest in the commons. My argument throughout much of my work, then, is that a re-engagement with anarchism within geographical theory and practice brings us closer to the possibility of shaking off the chains that fetter us to statist, capitalist, racist, sexist, and imperialist ideas. If we are to make the Colossus tremble, as Kropotkin once persuaded, then we must demonstrate to this force that we are awake and critically that we are aware of its geographical modes, which will not go unchallenged. Our greatest resource comes from our bonds to one another. Through the relational spaces of a universal geography and through the common interests of mutual aid. Recognizing such connection is an aesthetic realization that we all matter, that we are all part of the beauty of imminence. Within this recognition of our capacity for the beautiful comes strength and the seed of something new, nourished by the possibilities of our desire for a better world. In recent years, human geographers have begun actively thinking through how space and the multitude of factors that comprise it might be considered as a relational assemblage. This emergent theory owes much to Dorian Massey's watershed book, For Space, where she argues that conceptualizing space as open, multiple, and relational, unfinished and always becoming, is a prerequisite for history to be open, and thus a prerequisite too for the possibility of politics. So what res relational space refers to then is the idea that there are connections between and across spaces that are comprised of more than a single bond or immediately obvious linkage. Instead, relational space encourages us to think about space as a complex and iterative assemblage wherein ongoing and reciprocating exchanges between actors, events, and ideas continually play out through the process of life's evolving dance. As Asha Min explains, relationality refers to how the varied processes of spatial stretching, interdependence and flow combine in situ trajectories of social spatial evolution and change, where the result is, and I'm quoting a Min here, no simple displacement of the local by the global, of place by space, of history by simultaneity and flow, of small by, by big scale, or of the proximate by the remote. Instead, it is a subtle folding together of the distant and the proximate, the virtual and the material, presence and absence, flow and stasis into a single ontological plane. So thinking, rela uh, thinking space relationally then is at once an insistence on the connection between space and time uh, while at the same time recognizing that no place is isolated from the larger story of space. So we're all connected, is the idea here. Within this view, space is not simply uh, an empty container waiting for something to fill it with content, but it, it, it instead uh, is always an already filled with matter in the double sense of matter being a physical substance as a noun, and in terms of matter meaning having significance as a verb. Relational uh, space also attempts to attend to the question of what relations mean, their nature, and crucially, how they relate to questions of power. A relational geography is, in short, a way to try and make sense of a world that is infinitely complex and in an ever-changing process of becoming. Yet relational space is also indicative of a politics one with great possibility for expanding our circle of empathy and reorganizing the landscapes of power through strength and bonds. So rather than simply becoming, space in its idealized political form is about becoming beautiful, 
It is precisely in such beauty that we can envisage a connection to recluse much older theory of a universal geography. So with his expansive The Earth and Its Inhabitants, the universal geography which Reclus wrote from 1876 to 1894, uh, and it comprised 19 volumes, it's the single largest geographical work that I think has ever been produced. Um, so I'm working on the assumption that every one of us in this room has read all 19 volumes front to back, at least probably a few times, that we're all intimately familiar with this massive, voluminous work, right? Is that a good assumption? Yeah. Okay, excellent. We're all on the same page then. Um, okay, so the point is, Reclus, with the Earth and its inhabitants, the universal geography, he went to extraordinary lengths to advance the idea that all people should share the Earth as siblings and collectively refuse any claim to the superiority by one culture over another. And surely this is an optimistic idea, where from the vantage point of the post-colonial, post-structuralist present, the very language of universal may leave a bad taste in one's mouth. Recluse thinking was undoubtedly set within the limits of a 19th century European philosophy, but as Federico Ferretti argues, Recluse universalism is not the affirmation of a necessary assimilation or a fixed evolutionary process. It is more an affirmation of his hope in the planetary diffusion of the principles of cooperation and free federation. Accordingly, it is important to view his work as an attempt to advance an alternative to the colonialist excuse me, and racist discourses that dominated European experience at the time. So with Reclus, we can see an early iteration of a politics of possibility that looks to connection or relationality as its impetus. The language was different and far less nuanced than we can see within the current relational turn in geography, but the sentiment of drawing linkages across space to foster a broader empathetic horizon is largely the same. There are other parallels to be found with relational thinking as well, for Reclus was not just concerned with humans, but had an expanded view that emphasized our integral relationship with the environment that specifically sought to restore balance and equality between humans and the biosphere. Kropotkin endorsed similar ideas in his masterwork, Mutual Aid, A Factor in Evolution, where he looked to the symbiotic relations between peoples, plants, and animals as the enmeshment of humanity within the web of life. Both men therefore stood in stark contrast to a long history of Western thought that positioned humans at the apex of some imagined hierarchy, a stance that has deep resonance with the connectivity arguments coming out of geography's relational turn and other contemporary offshoots within the discipline like theories of emotion and affect, hybrid geographies, and non-representational theory. Reclus's geography was, of course, an anarchist one, and so he sought to spread awareness for the significance and viability of anarchist ideas, wherein his relational thinking was also manifest. He advocated for a decentralized version of power, wherein decision-making was to be guided by voluntary association and radical democracy, rather than be a coercive preserve of the elite or a vacuous and apolitical process of voting. Extending beyond the local frame, he saw much virtue in the notion of free federation among communities, which demonstrates a relational connection between the situatedness of direct access to power um, and a broader sense of belonging in the world. I've lost me here. Signal lighting. Uh, a broader sense of belonging in the world. Um, Okay, to reclue, anarchists should work to free themselves from imposed or preconceived ideas uh, by gradually surrounding themselves with those who choose to live and act in a similar fashion. He thus also hinted at what are today referred to in anarchist studies as prefigurative politics, which is a term that was coined by Karl Boggs to denote the forms of social relations and modes of organization that are being enacted in the present as a reflection of the future society being sought. In short, prefiguration is a collapsing of the means and ends that attempts to give form to our ideals by building a new society in the shell of the old, right here and right now. <laughs>
For a clue, such a politics became possible through what he called small, loving, and intelligent societies, which would eventually translate into the great fraternal society of the universal geography that he so desired. Reclus was thus also advancing the notion that personal and social transformations were intimately linked, which has been taken up in anarchist practice and theory through the notion of affinity groups, which come together out of shared interests and common goals. In other words, Reclus advanced a relational notion of the commons by employing a decidedly geographical imagination that envisioned a connection between the immediate context and the wider social frame. So on that uh, note of the commons, if this will agree to move forward, there we go. Uh, I want to talk then about the idea of the commons itself and specifically reclaiming the commons as a form of mutual aid. So connecting the idea of the commons then to uh, the way that Kropotkin was effectively thinking about the world. Um, this is a quote from the Collective Autonomy Research Group, which is a, a, an anarchist group in, uh, based in Ontario, Canada, uh, and a piece called The Anarchist Commons, where they're saying, the anarchist commons is more than just the sum of its parts. It is a deep-seated political project, prefiguring a constantly evolving alternative political form based on principles of collective autonomy, self-determination, and self-organization, put into practice in the pleasure, work, everyday living and activist organizing that make up all of our lives. So they're seeing it as uh, something that's, you know, very foundational to the way that we, that most of us actually live in the world. Even, even under capitalism. Okay, so reclaiming the commons as mutual aid. The idea of the commons refers to a communal sense of resources and land use whereby communities and individuals share that which they collect, cultivate, and create. Put differently, resources and land are simply held in common. So pretty straightforward. Prior to recorded human history, it is thought that the world existed in a state of a universal commons that lasted for tens of thousands of years. Indeed, the transformation of the symbiotic equilibrium of the commons into the uneven capitalist relations we see today was only made possible by human claims to private property, a process known as enclosure or primitive accumulation. Processes of agrarian change have repeatedly seen people lose their self-sufficiency by being pushed off their commonly held land and into wage labor. The entire structure of our relation to each other and our world has been dramatically transformed from cooperation to competition in the pursuit of capital, a process made possible by the state, which evolved in concert with capitalism as a means to entrench class privilege through the monopolization of violence. As Leo Tolstoy explained, and yes, it's that Leo Tolstoy, the same individual uh, who, wrote, who wrote a lot of very long novels, so uh, I guess the second longest book ever produced other than Recluse, War and Peace, and I'll work on the assumption we've all read that multiple times in multiple languages, right? Another good assumption? Yes? Okay. So uh, Tolstoy wasn't just a novelist, he was also a philosopher and he was deeply inspired by anarchist thought. He never, today people talk about Tolstoy as a pacifist anarchist or a Christian anarchist, but Tolstoy himself, he never identified uh, as anarchist, but again he was um, very engaged in anarchist debates and, and within uh, anarchist networks uh, during the time of his life. So, Tolstoy had this to say about property. He said, history shows that property and land did not arise from any wish to make the cultivator's tenure more secure, but resulted from the seizure of communal lands by conquerors and its distribution to those who served the conqueror. The fruit of their toil is unjustly and violently taken from the workers, and then the law steps in. And these very articles which have been taken from the workmen unjustly and by, and by violence are declared to be the absolute property of those who have taken them. So the connection then between property, law, the state, and capitalism. 
Okay, returning to Kropotkin and mutual aid, uh, with Kropotkin's, uh, or Kropotkin's general project with mutual aid, uh, and indeed the origin of, of this particular book, was to offer a rebuttal to the supposedly Darwinian ideas of survival of the fittest and all against all that underpin the very idea of capital accumulation, or supposedly. Uh, Kropotkin understood such arguments advanced by people like Thomas Henry Huxley, which he, he was referred to often as Darwin's bulldog. Um, but uh, in Kropotkin's view, Huxley had Darwin entirely wrong. He looked at that, uh, this interpretation of survival of the fittest as being a mischaracterization of Darwin's actual project, and he wanted to explicitly point out that evolution was characterized as much by cooperation between organisms and their environments as it was a direct struggle among individuals for limited resources. And Kropotkin said uh, that this was as true for biology as it was for politics. Okay, for Kropotkin, mutual aid was a form of organizing drawn from time immemorial, where involuntary reciprocal exchange was the norm. Mutual aid was thought to provide strong community bonds and foster a deep sense of affinity and empathy for other human beings, as well as for non-human animals and the wider biosphere was meant as a recognition of our irreducible entanglement within the web of life and as a refusal of the hierarchy that pervaded in our thinking about the world we live in and our connections to others. The relationship to the commons should be immediately evident as a sense of something being held in common is only made possible via an appreciation for reciprocity and cooperation. In short, any given commons is a geographical manifestation of mutual aid. What this suggests is that the so-called tragedy of the commons, a rallying point for defenders of capitalism and neoliberals everywhere, is little more than a myth. The refusal of this fabrication has gained significant traction in recent years, thanks in no small part to the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who in 2009 won the Nobel Prize in economics for her work. And what I want to argue is that her work actually validates long-held an anarchist principles by challenging the conventional wisdom that common property is poorly managed and should be either privatized or regulated by the state. The tragedy of the commons, or the so-called tragedy of the commons, which was first articulated by Garrett Hardin uh, in the late 1960s, is so often treated as an irrefutable justification for private property and the privatization of land. Yet there is no empirical basis to his argument, and nor was it informed by historical or current practice. Hardin, uh, who used a hypothetical example of cattle grazing, utterly failed to reflect the reality of the commons as a social institution and instead demonstrated that private ownership represents the heart of the actual problem. So what he did is he failed to realize that his argument never considered cattle themselves as potentially being a commonly held resource in addition to land. And instead he showed just how limited his own political imagination was as he positioned them as being already privately owned and indiscriminately grazing in a supposedly common, common field. So what people, I mean, this is a, a repeated myth, right? Neoliberals everywhere say this time and time again. Well, we need capitalism, we need markets because of the tragedy of the commons, on and on. I mean, this is since the 1960s, right? That, that Hardin first articulated this. What everyone seems to forget is that Hardin himself turned his back on his own argument. He disavowed what he wrote. He said, yeah, I actually got it all wrong. There's no validity to what I've said here. But nonetheless, nobody remembers that part. It's just the taken for grantedness of this discourse. It, sound, it rolls off the tongue, right? Tragedy of the commons for capitalists anyways. But what Hardin actually demonstrated in this work uh, was the tragedy of capitalism. So very explicitly, if we, if we analyze his argument a little deeper, it shows the tragedy of capitalism arising particularly through individual utility maximizing behavior, right? The cattle were not commonly held, they were individually owned, and so each owner of those cattle was engaging in, you know, 
self-preservation, self-promotion sort of thing. This is the tragedy of capitalism. Moreover, the commons were never a free-for-all of the type that Hardin describes, and instead they were well managed by common agreements, reciprocal arrangements, and shared interests between those who actually used them. So the commons were a living, breathing process. They were, they were something that were continually being negotiated. It wasn't cut and dry. Oh yeah, they're just misused sort of thing. That was Hardin's assumption. So his entire argument was premised upon his ignorance of how the commons actually work. Part of the reason why Hardin's myth became so prevalent stems from the ongoing confusions over what property actually means and how it has become a taken for granted concept within contemporary political discourse. At the heart of anarchist thought is the distinction between, between property on the one hand and possession on the other, which was first outlined by Pierre Joseph, Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Uh, and he did so in his most well-known work, uh, What is Property?, which he answered rhetorically, property is theft. Um, and in this work, Proudhon traced the pro property to the Roman law concept of sovereign right whereby a proprietor, a proprietor could use and abuse his property as he wished so long as he retained state-sanctioned title. And so we can already see some of the problematics woven in uh, to property that it's, very, uh, it's rooted in very gendered assumptions, right? This is not something that uh, Proudhon necessarily wove into his own critique. He was well known as being uh, quite sexist and misogynistic. Um, but we can take some of the interesting ideas that Proudhon had about property and nonetheless use them in contemporary anarchist thought. And this is, you know, Proudhon was the first person to enter, ever identify himself as an anarchist, but um, this is part of the reason why we are anarchists today and not Proudhonists, is that we can recognize, you know, we don't engage in the cult of personality the same way that Marxists do, but we can also recognize that many of, uh, of the individuals in the past who contributed useful ideas to anarchist theory also held some uh, problematic ideas that are, are and should be open to critique in the present moment. Okay, in any event, property in Proudhon's reading uh, was a juridical institutional means for exploitation and he viewed it as an affront to the liberty, equality, and security of the community. In short, property represented a categorical threat to the commons. Hopefully we can get this back here. Uh, Proudhon contrasted the supposedly God-given sovereign right of property with possession, which he understood as a practice of actual use that therefore could not be mobilized for exploitation. So as an example, a house that one lives in uh, can be regarded as a possession because it's premised upon actual use, while a house that is rented out becomes a means for exploiting others and can be thus considered as property, right? Within property, we see a means for exploitation, possession, there is no such exploitation going on. The commons is similarly rooted in actual use rather than sovereign right, and is thus similarly considered as a possession where the only difference is that it is communally rather than individually used. So while property attempts to mobilize the means of production as a natural sovereign right of an individual or proprietor, Proudhon argued that this was an illegitimate form of use and he considered it as a form of theft from the commons. This is not to say that a means of production should not exist, which is of course impossible, but rather that such means should not belong to a sovereign proprietor as a so-called natural right. Instead, everyone connected to the said means of production should share in the bounty and surpluses it produces as a commons. Property is fundamentally at odds with the notion of the commons insofar as it relies on coercion, exclusion, hierarchy, and most notably enforcement or law to maintain its viability. The commons has no such mobilization of force and is instead a reciprocal exchange of common interests and shared benefits, or in other words, mutual aid. Property is a relation of domination, and this is an understanding that I have advanced in some of my other work, particularly uh, in the context of Cambodia. A lot of my empirical work uh, is working with um, 
communities that have been either threatened with or subjected to forced evictions. Um, and what I've come to appreciate in the course of that work is that, uh, you know, as a property system is rolled out across Cambodia, we can see the violence that is inherently embedded into this creation of property. So it's never pleasant the way that uh, people's possessions, that is their, their actual use, right? The idea of actual use, the way that is robbed from them through brute, uh, brute force and vi the violence of the state. Okay, so I want to argue that property is not just theft, as, as Proudhon wanted to say. I'm wanting to say that property is violence, uh, a distinct form of violence. So when one hears of anarchists committing violence against property, a deep sense of cynicism should be reserved, as this can hardly be considered as violence at all. Instead, it actually represents a pushback against violence. Likewise, I do not consider self-defense as a form of violence, as there is no impetus for coercion or domination, but rather a desire for self-preservation. I actually advocate a peaceful stance for anarchism, and in an effort to be clear, I want to indicate what I mean by this commitment to nonviolence. When I refer to violence, I'm calling into question an unequal power relation that involves some element of coercion and or domination over others, which can either be direct and immediately visible or indirect and spatially and temporally diffuse. So although I consider my arguments as pacifist in their orientation, I do not assume this to mean that people should simply kneel at the foot of their oppressor when the weight of violence comes crashing down upon their backs. There is often a distinct need to rise and defend oneself, which should similarly not be confused as violence. At the same time, I cannot lend my support to premeditated or preemptive attacks against life and limb that intend to maim or kill regardless of the social position from which such strikes are being organized. The point is, is that violence begets violence and in keeping with a relational understanding of space, any path towards emancipation that includes violence as part of its practice will only inevitably, only and inevitably result in further bloodshed. Since the prefigurative politics of anarchism interpret means and ends as inseparable, and because anarchism is a desire for a more equitable and peaceful world, one should expect that violence cannot form part of its content. So, this is, uh, it's a nuanced sort of understanding here, and basically what I'm wanting to say is that anarchists, we shouldn't label our own activities as, as violence, right? We're, our intention is not coercion, it's not domination, and that is a label that the state and the mainstream media use to frequently discredit anarchist movements. It's very easy to just say, oh, anarchism, violence, right? And, uh, in Canada, anyways, anarchism and violence are seen as synonymous concepts, right? Chaos, disorder, violence, this sort of thing. Um, but there's no intention for coercion and domination. And what I'm wanting to say is the state claims a monopoly to violence. So in some ways, shouldn't we just simply, okay, violence is disgusting, vi violence is uh, horrendous, Let's let that be the domain of the state, right? To show their ugliness, to show how brutal uh, they actually are, and not call our struggles, even though it can be forceful, even though um, resistance needs to be there, to refuse that label of violence because of the, uh, the ability of the state to control the narrative in that way, right? If we, if we are able to identify our own politics on our own terms rather than the state identifying what we're doing time and time again as violence, don't we have a better possibility of um, potentially broadening the appeal? So in some ways it's a rhetorical, discursive questioning of violence and how that's being applied, but of course rhetoric and uh, discourse don't ever just float in the air, they always attach themselves to actual, you know, material space, material geography, they're part of the, the living, breathing process. So it's a, a, a bit of a nuanced argument there about violence and the, and the place for that. Again, we should struggle, we should resist, but um, 
I don't want the state or, or anyone else to be able to just simply categorize that as violence when the intention is never domination. And so for me, we can even think about the etymology of anarchism, right? Archism being systems of rule, systems of domination. And anytime we um, uh, accept this idea of domination, uh, you know, anarchism is transformed no longer into being against domination, but into a form of domination, then it's no longer anarchism, but rather a form of archism, right? Um, so anarchism against the, these kinds of uh, violence as domination. Okay, uh, returning to the commons, uh, in the final analysis, it's the case that the notions of relationality and the commons are not mutually exclusive or diametrically opposed. Instead, when we think about their connections as parts of the pillars of anarchism, the relational and the commons come together as the two most fundamental components of procuring a universal geography and of rehearsing mutual aid. The anarchist notion of voluntary association further speaks to the relational connections across space and between various actors with shared interests. Such affinities, which are built through relational connections, are manifested as direct action in the hope of claiming space as common. We are able to reclaim the commons not through violence, that is, not through coercion and domination, but rather through our connections to each other and the idea that we are all imbued within a relational assemblage of shared goals. This is how the commons become common. Similarly, we are able to recognize our affinities, bonds, and solidarities only when we have a functioning sense of the commons, as it enables us to understand our relations to others. This synergy is why the struggle over space is so vitally important to convening a new and beautiful politics in our world, and it goes some way towards explaining why anarchism and geography make such good bedfellows. The idea of the commons and the, theory of, uh, and the theory of relational space work in tune with one another as an iterative process of empowerment and collectivity. In short, much like the anarchist idea that theory and practice are two sides to the same coin known as praxis, you cannot separate a claim to the commons from the relational connections that exist between individuals acting in the interest of mutual aid. can get this. Okay, you've all been very patient. I want to end with the idea of hope. Um, and not just any hope, but hope beyond hope. And I'm using crime think here, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, an uh, anarchist organization. Uh, this particular quote, uh, which is one of their posters actually, comes from one of their posters. It was particularly inspiring for thinking about, thinking through both anarchism and geography in my mind. And I, I saw a bit of a resonance with what Reclus had to say as well, the quote that I started with. Uh, anyways, Crime Think says, beauty must be defined as what we are or else the concept itself is our enemy. Why languish in the shadow of a standard we cannot personify, an ideal that we cannot live? To see beauty is to learn the private language of meaning, which is another's life to recognize and relish what is. Okay, hope beyond hope. Anarchism is not about breaking away from society and fleeing from the systems and structures that dominate our lives. It is about refusing them here, in this space, and now, in this moment, by converting thoughts into action through prefiguration. As Reclus proclaimed, Never will we separate ourselves from the world to build a little church hidden in some vast wilderness. Here is the fighting ground, and we remain in the ranks ready to give our help wherever it may be needed most. We do not cherish premature hopes, but we know that our efforts will not be lost. In other words, anarchism takes hold of hope by refusing to let it linger as an ideal never realized, a promise never fulfilled, or a dream never lived. It is not enough to yearn for something more, something different, and something new. 
We must be willing to embrace our fear of the unknown and realize that the familiar landscapes of hierarchy are little more than a debilitating crutch, undermining our creative capacities by beguiling us with their unyielding series of false promises. For centuries now, we have been conditioned to believe that their old order, supported by police, magistrates, and soldiers, is the first and last chance for humanity to thrive. Yet instead of order, they bring forth chaos. Instead of prosperity, poverty and insecurity. Instead of reconciled interests, war, a perpetual war of the exploiter against the exploited. This is an order that has brought the world to the precipice of environmental catastrophe. And now, as we choke on the ashes of complacency through blackened lungs, it threatens to jump headlong into the abyss. It is an order that has flirted openly with nuclear annihilation, asking us to trust its supposed fidelity to our well-being as it conspires against us, surging ever onwards towards the apotheosis of war. It is an order that has repeatedly demonstrated its willingness to abuse, indoctrinate, exploit, punish, ridicule, harass, fleece, regulate, curse, imprison, tax, vilify, mock, judge, monopolize, fine, repress, and condemn us as part of its moral faculty. It is a vile abomination, a parasitic void, a colossus, emboldened by artifice, animated by greed, and swallowed by the flagrancy of its own ego. Yet we willingly feed this revolting beast a steady diet of our own flesh. Our young are consumed as its soldiers, our old become its sages, and the sick are celebrated as our commanders, clergy, and kings. Weary of the circular ruins that have been piled high at the hearth of humanity, anarchists seek new forms of organization. We ask how it is that words so often left to hang empty and breathless in the wind like the echoes of distant bells might be given life by being changed into actions. For Kropotkin, the answer was easy, even if he recognized it meant a great deal of hard work. He looked to an endless commitment to transformation as the key, wherein courage, care, and the spirit of community become just as contagious as cowardice, compliance, and the politics of command and control. To renew ourselves and thrive, we need to start seeing each other. I mean more than simply opening our eyes beyond myopic self-interest, and instead really taking the time to look deeply and carefully at the meaning of each other's lives. The fact that there is consciousness in the universe is an amazing revelation. It is a gift beyond all measure. Yet life is tragically fragile, and for now we can only confirm that it clings defiantly to a speck of dust somewhere at the edge of the Milky Way. This sentiment alone should give us moment for pause. If anything, the minutia of our differences should inspire wonder as opposed to doubt, solidarity as opposed to hostility, and empathy instead of apathy. Our strength against the fragility of life is derived, as Kropotkin argued, from our ability to engage in mutual aid. If we are to make a, land a lasting stand against the forces of the cosmos, which positions us as an infinitesimally small blip in its grand and glorious dance, then we must relish the collective strength we share with each other and the entirety of the Gaia that nurtures and supports us. The death grip that we have administered on the earth over the past few centuries, primarily through the institutions of capital and the state, suggests that the value we place on life has been eclipsed by the greed of human arrogance. If life is to continue to flourish on this planet, it is by now commonplace and even trite to suggest that it is high time we tried a radically different approach. Yet hope for a better future cannot flourish when fear undermines our willingness to experiment. We can no longer be content to dwell in the dream of possibility, to trust the proclamations of academics, 
or follow the commands of a president. Deep down, we know what is really required to, shape, to change the shape and course of our world is a single act of courage, kindness, or community that originates from within ourselves. In the singular, any such act may appear meaningless against the oppressive deluge of the status quo. Multiplied by our numbers and committed in solidarity with others, the colossus that we have all breathed life into begins to shake with fear and gasp for air. How can we make plans for the future on something as frail as hope when we have not spent the time cultivating our desire into the strength of actual lived experience? This question reveals the importance of anarchism. It is a beautiful enabler. Without embracing our capacity for living now and doing in this moment what we would otherwise leave to the protocols of authority, we kneel exposed at the foot of the giant with his cruel and ugly shadow drawn out upon our backs. For those of us who embrace anarchism, we don't simply yearn for the light, we stand and walk towards it claiming that strength is to be found not in what is dreamt possible, but as an illumination of the powerful beauty we collectively represent. So let us reject the darkness that threatens to devour us all. Let us convene a new language of ascetics that places each and every one of us at the center of its conversation. Let us become beautiful by recognizing the meaning of each other's lives in concert with our own. But most of all, let us awaken to the fact that beautiful is something we already are. This sentiment forms the heart of an anarchist geography. It is our path to spatial emancipation. And that's all I got.